limit line. Uh, well, good afternoon. Yes, it's a few minutes after uh, midday. Um, good afternoon and welcome, everybody. Um, some of you know me already. Uh, my name is Emma Griffiths. I am the Training and Development Officer with Life Historic Buildings Trust um, on the Invocating Heritage and Generation Project. The um, Invocating Heritage and Generation Project is a five year project. Um, it is five council projects, and we are helping them deliver it. Um, thanks to the funders, that's Historic Environment Scotland, the, the lottery, um, and then some of the individual elements of the project have been an additional funder. So the Scottish Government um, Regenerating Capital Grant Fund has also been involved. And that's how we're able to do all of these outreach activities. Um, just to tell people about what we're doing and why it's important. Thank you very much to the Lion Centre for their help in hosting us today, for the technical help and the training which they do, which is another element of our um, work that we do through the um, activity plan. We uh, help people uh, increase their traditional skills, and that's something we do marvellously well here. Um, I'll stop talking about the project and hand you over to Steve Wood from Narrows, who is the Technical Director of Conservation. He can tell you all about what they've been doing at the Cleveland Townhouse for the DC. Thank you. Um, hello. I'm going to sit down. I've got a bad back, so if I stand up, I'll just be fidgeting all over the place and just, just being annoying. Um, apologies. Um, if any questions occur to you, just ask them straight away. Don't wait till the end. Um, in some ways, I find talks go better if it becomes a little bit interactive, I think. Um, yeah. Um, what I'm, yeah, so who am I? I'm Steve Wood. I'm, uh, I work for a platform called Narrow, formerly David Narrow Associates. Um, we are a firm of consulting instruction and civil engineers based in Edinburgh, but with offices all over the place, and you, you'll see we, we hold serving, so we have a spectrum, essentially. The, um, we are practiced about 85 strong or so, and a vast proportion of our work is in the existing built environment, an existing building is in there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and invariably, it is a, an existing building having some historical importance. Um, I am conservation accredited. I'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm also, I was also a scholar with the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. I was that in 2005, and that is a, um, a training course, I presume you describe it as. Uh, lasts for about nine months, um, touring the UK, sometimes abroad, learning about conservation in action. I did that in 2005. Um, that's a good start, isn't it? I can't do the thing, sorry. Um, yeah. I'm actually a child watch it. Really, I'm not a The third one, three. Yeah. <laughs> We, we, that, that was totally planned. Um, yeah, so in the Keating Tower House, um, you may well know the background of it already. Emma's already said a little bit about it, but it is the flagship project of the regeneration team. Um, the regeneration team of into Keating, um, one and a half million pounds contract value. Um, and the intention is to, to bring back into use in a sustainable way. Um, and important and important historic building in the town centre. Um, so community use, mixed community use um, that can be given over to small or large organisations. There's a full design team in place, um, project managed by, by Historic Buildings Trust on behalf of the client client council. Um, 
lead consultant architect, um, Mark, based in Trooper. Thank you. Um, and then quantity surveying, mechanical and electrical engineers, and myself as structural engineers, um, and main contractor, Ashford. Is anyone from Ashford here? No, maybe virtually. Um, now, the project existed before we got involved. Um, we got involved, um, a point of when was it? Uh, 2016, um, after an options appraisal had been carried out. Um, then there was some development work done into that options appraisal, and then the preferred scheme was given the go-ahead in March 2018, um, started on site uh, spring last year and is inching towards a completion. Um, I think the end is the end of April, but I don't know for sure. Um, yep, yeah, now I've touched on that before. I don't think I'll say anything more about it. It's basically what the purpose of the project was. Um, now, what is the building? Um, as as it is as it was before we started, it was a building of um, some history, some development history. But as a thing to use, it was it was an awkward building to use. There's no what I've coloured in. These are the floor plans: um, ground floor. First floor, second floor, and roof. Um, and I've coloured in where you could, how you could access the different points. So you could only really access ground floor from ground floor. But first floor, you had to go upstairs and then up and down levels and things. And it was just an awkward place to to just get around, um, and a place of small rooms and what have you, which really not suitable for it didn't give you freedom, no flexibility. Um, also. The condition of it wasn't dilapidated at all, not at all, but um, a sorry stay, not fully serviced, that sort of thing. So, the 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 target was to actually open the building up. The desire was to open the building up and basically maximise its flexibility. Because through having maximum flexibility, you can you know it just becomes a desirable place for people to use. Um, a particular constraint, which we'll come on to later, which you may be aware of, is uh, this is a section through the building, street side on the left, um, behind it, um, the ground level much higher than at the front, and the ground, the building backed onto a kirkyard. Um, and in the in the built-up ground, lots and lots of graves. Have to be mindful of that from the start. Now, from a development point of view, this is this is this shows my understanding, our understanding of the general development of the building. Um, the oldest part uh, in green here is, is the bell tower, um, which in its current form, I think, was finished in about 1755 or so. Yeah, but it may well have existed, at least in part, much, much earlier than that. Um, the townhouse, the blue bit, um, constructed um, pretty much in one go over the course of the year. And that's, that's what you see in blue. And then there were various small scale alterations, rooms created, walls taken down, rebuilt, that sort of thing. And that's what I'm showing in the blue. Can I ask what the bell tower was for when it stood alone? Or did it stand alone? I don't know if it's alone. Shall I, shall I yes. answer that one? Um, it was probably, um, the only building on the site, so it probably had legal functions, civic functions, um, a place of security. So it would be where you know if they levied fines, it would be when the money was kept, um, where a court met, or where a council met. So it probably was in a tiny, um, sort of tower house to perform all the functions that as the time grew and as time grew gone, it's found into the project, which is still a huge building. Okay. Now, what I'm going to cover 
in my talk is how we dealt with this from a structural point of view and how we would deal with similar buildings from a structural point of view. When I go through the process we would go through, um, I'm going to highlight the process, I'm going to illustrate the process using examples directly from this project, but where they're not, where they weren't encountered in this project, I'm using other examples. Um, sometimes the other examples are from England Shire, but don't be distracted by that, it's the principle I'm talking about. Um, and the process is basically what's there. It's, it's about understanding what we've got. Um, it's about understanding how what we've got arrived at what we've got. It's about understanding how what we've got behaves as a structure. It's about understanding how tolerant that structure is of change. And then it's about devising that change, communicating that change, and obviously enacting that change. So, building appraisal. Four basic steps of it. You look, you think, you investigate, and you analyze. Simple as that. So, with the looking, it is just a case of walking around and looking, taking photos, looking, staring, looking, and seeing. Um, in the case of the townhouse, um, some photos there at the top. Um, the first point I've already talked about is the presence of the kirkyard right at the back and how the ground levels of the kirkyard are significantly higher than the ground levels at the front of the building and the ground levels, the floor levels inside the, the lower floor level inside the building. Um, other aspect is. There's a general slope across the site. You can see that in the top right photo there. Not that significant, but of most significance, really, when you're planning altering a building, is the building is as landlocked as it could be. There is no space really around, around it. You know, you've got public road going across the front, you've got buildings um, hard up against yours, and those buildings are of comparable age, perhaps older. Old age. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, a phrase I was always taught to use, which sticks, and I hate using it, but I'm going to use it, is the, from the from the global to the particular. So, you know, it's you're zooming in all the time. So the first thing, standing back, look at it. How does it sit? How does your thing sit within its context? And then you're getting in closer. Um, a thing you're looking about is, ooh, chimneys. Chimney pots sticking up. Out the gate. So, you know, chimneys, um, can't see from that photo, there are five, I think, chimney pots, each gable, well, five chimney pots obviously implies five fireplaces, and five fireplaces within that wall, the blues and the fireplaces have to exist within the wall and find their way around the wall. I'll come back to that later. Other things to look at, and these are not our building, you might realise, is, um, I hope you can make that out, but there's a lot of, this is um, a Georgian building, it's uh, Green Law Town Hall, um, lots of vegetation growing out of the wall heads. Obviously for vegetation to be there, there needs to be moisture and with a lot of vegetation, there's a lot of moisture and if there's moisture in your walls, that is, you know, it can't be a good thing. So imply straight away, you, you're gonna have a problem with damp in your building, which may affect Timber components, floor choice, lintel, that sort of thing. Um, or, or degradation of materials because of poor previous use of incompatible materials. Um, cement, modern cement based mortars are not good for traditional buildings. And if, if the cements are significantly harder and denser than the, the surrounding stonework, the stonework will decay. And it's, it's all about that. If you, if you see indications of, of stonework decay because of, because of the application of materials like that, it's like, have 
apparently small scale issues being replicated throughout the building. Are you going to be finding a building which has a myriad of small scale things going on with it? And then um, a roof truss with, uh, this is a king post truss, basically triangular with a with things coming inside of it. Um, the bottom cord has snapped. Um, why is that? That again can in, infer a, a problem of damping rest from somewhere else. So, you know, a thing, thing shouldn't break. And if a thing is broken, why is it broken? So it's all about being seen. Then the next is questioning what you're seeing. Um, I mentioned the chimney stacks before, come back to those. Um, the, this is, this is where the, the toll booth part of the, the, the bell tower part of the building interacts with the townhouse bit at the back. And there seems to be two different phases of construction there. Is there or is there not? It's something to be to have in mind. And then at the front, um, just the, the little out, out step in the wall there, on the left seems to be the bell tower itself, and on the right is the townhouse. So how does one meet the other? Do they actually tie them together? Are they of a piece or is they, are they just putting up and they're not in contact? Things like that. Um, again, a roof truss whose bottom cord has snapped and has been repaired in quite a, an imaginative way. But actually, did that? why did that thing break? <coughs> has the repair missed the point of why the thing broke in the first place? And whilst it's quite fun and exciting to see a repair like that, perhaps it's actually missed the point and the, a, a different thing could have been done. Um, then it doesn't really come up so clearly, sorry, is if there's been different phases of construction, if there's been development in your building, how do the two phases of construction interact together? Has something been done when change was carried out before, which has compromised the stability or the integrity or the robustness of the original? Um, and this is an example of a 15th century roof, a crown post roof structure, which has been cut and carved um, so much that it's like a pack of cards about to come down. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. And then funny little things where you've got a timber frame building with, that doesn't really show up, sorry, um, what looks like brickwork on the upper story. Well, you couldn't have brickwork on another story of a timber frame building. Is that actually brickwork or is it? thin brick slips, tiles, if you like, stuff on the front. So, yeah, so don't take things at face value. Ah, so then you investigate. Um, an investigation, um, sometimes you just have to dig holes, make holes through plastic or pl plastic finishes and that sort of thing, just to see what is behind. Um, the major investigation we undertook at Townhouses was um, to determine where the how deep the walls were found. Um, and we did trial pits inside and outside the building. Um, these are the records from those investigations. We did investigations inside because there was a desire to replace the existing floor structure at ground level with something which could accommodate insulation, improve the energy efficiency of the building. And outside in the graveyard, Kirkyard, um, because there, as, as we got into the design process for the building, choosing what we do and where, it becoming increasingly obvious that we would have to dig in the Kirkyard. And so we wanted to get a, a real sense of what we would encounter in the Kirkyard um, in so much as how deep the wall were, were and how many graves we might find. Um, those carpets were undertaken by an archaeologist um, because, we were, because we were operating in the Kirkyard, sensitivities to the Kirkyard and all that. Um, also, I've mentioned chimney flues. Um, I hope you can make this out, but this is a gable wall, obviously of a bigger building, but you can see Oh, for some reason, a building has been taken down and you can see the exposed gable wall and you can see all the fireplaces and all the roots of the flues going through the wall. Um, the point being is that you, you can, a gable wall might look thick and thick and solid, but actually 
isn't so solid as you might think. You've got blues going through everywhere. Um, you can you can detect, you can map those clues out using ground penetrating radar. Thing that they use on time team. You can use it on the walls. Um, there's an example, so I fit the, but this is an example which has been scanned through GPR on the wall and it's mapped out where the flues are. A, you want to know where the flues are because it's always good to know where it always is. B, so, um, it's quite common for masonry about flues to degrade just because they've been exposed to the soots, the blue gases, and dampness, which can erode the stonework. So um, if you are finding that you are having to create openings or cha change the wall in any way, it's good to know beforehand that you might encounter poor quality masonry rather than be surprised by it in sight. And it also gives you added ammunition to try and dissuade your design compatriots to not go through the <laughs> yeah. holes. Because, you know, the answer is never no, is it? It's always you can do this, but it might be more expensive, more complicated. Um, when you're doing investigations, you, you, you sort of need to come up what you're investigating from more than one approach, more than one perspective sometimes. Um, this is obviously not in the key thing, it's St Paul's Cathedral in London. Um, and for whatever reason, we had cause to investigate the nature of the wall to the south transept. Um, and we did that, this, initially by drilling holes, tubes, cordially into the walls to see what the construction was like in the centre of them. The walls are two and a half metres thick. So, core drilling happening. This is what we were getting out from the wall. So, that box, each section is a metre long, and you can see for a two metre thick wall, we're not getting anything out of the wall, really, which on the face of it is a bit alarming. <laughs> now, um, back in the day, in the 1930s day, um, there's, there's a front of St Paul, there's a front of cathedral. This is underneath the big dome. Uh, I don't know if you can make out, but the dome is carried by eight piers. Um, set a couple more points, not quite. Dome sits on eight piers. Here's our arches carried dome. Um, in the 1910s or 20s, something like that, um, there was, there was, everyone got worried that the dome was about to collapse because bits of masonry were falling from on high. And yeah, there was there was panic. There was a um, dangerous building notice uh, on the building, very real risk that the, the cathedral would be closed. So investigations were done to see, yeah, the suspicion fell on the piers and investigations were done to see how the piers were made. And these are big three metre, four metre big things. And in the same way as we did core drills, they core drilled in, pulled out what they found, and they were finding similar things. So there was a massive program of pumping concrete grout into the piers to make them solid again, to fill all the voids that they had encountered. And um, it was called the Great Restoration, and, and, and many reputations were made on it. But um, someone did an analysis of the work that was done, and this is quite a bit after the event, and good record for Ket, we know what was done, and the volume of grout, volume of cement grout, concrete grout that was poured into the piers is the same volume as the volume of cores that they drilled in. So, point being is, the other investigation we did at the same time is we put a camera down the hole, and there's the view of what you see down the hole, and the wall is perfectly solid throughout. And what they were finding, and what we were finding, is that the mere action of drilling into the wall was just was just flushing away the softer matrix of which all the stone pieces were held. And so we we dry cored this and it just flushed it away about dust. Because the wall is solid, must much of the stuff inside the wall is quite soft. It's not as hard, not nothing like strong as the stone, but given the wall's two meters thick, it's as strong as it needs to be. 
there is no problem with the ball, there is no problem with the peers. There is a perceived problem which they felt they needed to address, but actually there wasn't a problem there. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, a couple of things, more than one angle, it's good. Um, now, analysis. Um, uh, doing numbers and design and things like that. Um, there, if a building has been there for a long time um, and is performing perfectly well, then that's justification enough for it to continue being there for a long time and to perform perfectly well, as long as you dealt with defects to do with downward press and decay and that sort of thing. Um, and if you can satisfy yourself, and this is not a flippant satis satisfaction, but if you can show, if, if you can satisfy yourself that the way the building has been used in the past is actually the same as the way you're going to use it in the future, there you go, you can, you can carry on as you were. Um, as long as it is understood that a building does not necessarily, it, it won't be a modern building. You know, there's no way a timber floor can be anything like as strong or as stiff or as rigid as a concrete floor. Of course it can't, but so what? Um, the, in the key thing, it's quite a basic structure. It's essentially four walls, floor to which span the front to back, good chunk of things. Some issues of damp to deal with, repairs and that, but generally speaking, we had no concerns about the strength of the floor. But um, I think there are times, and this is a building in Liverpool, um, tobacco warehouse on the docks of Liverpool, whereby we couldn't, uh, it's, it's a former tobacco bond warehouse, um, being redeveloped as various use things, apartments, hotel, that sort of thing. Um, we knew exactly what the floor structure was made of. We've done investigations, we've got blueprints and what have you, but we couldn't justify the strengths of the floors to, to, be, to be capable of, of carrying the loads to which we wanted to apply on the floors. But because it's a bond warehouse, um, we had very detailed records of what was stored and where, we were able to get, we knew exactly what size barrels would go in the floor and how they would be arranged, where they came from, how heavy they would be. And from that, we could do a back check to show that actually these floors have always carried this degree of loading, which is a degree higher than what we're putting onto it. There you go. So it's a logic. It's not necessarily a scientific logic, but it is a logic. It is completely um demonstrable what's the word it's you know it's provable um yeah so um now it's about understanding how your building developed and then you know how can again it's the next stage in understanding what your structure is um and again it's looking um talked before about how the townhouse walls meet the the walls of of the, the bell tower um Sometimes it might be quite obvious how a thing has changed. Sometimes one might get an archaeologist in to do um, a standing building archaeological search. This is another building. An archaeology has done an archaeologist has done an assessment on how you know the different ages of the different parts. Um, this is a farmhouse down in Buckinghamshire. This is the building I started to talk about early on with the crown post roof and different developments. Um, I'll talk about it again a bit more, but you see from the front, it looks a bit of a piece, but as you look down the side, you can see there are different parts to it. Um, and the oldest part of the building is this part, and it's been cut and carved and added to and added to. So again, you see how things have changed. There's obviously documentary research you can do. Um, maybe blueprints. Um, maybe building accounts. Um, in the case of the town hall, um, we were local archaeologist records um, referring to um, Arkans, as was, Historic Environment Scotland's records. Um, we have 
Emma, remind me what this is. This is the insurance yeah, document. Yeah, there's a plaque on the front of the building on class plans, and this is um, one of the building records that is cared for by the um, local history society who manage an archive of documents in there. And this is the actual insurance certificate which shows that they came to insure the building. And before we had formalized fire brigades, um, insurance companies had their own fire brigades. So if you have the plaque, if you have the class plans on your building, the class plans insurance company would come and put out any fires in the building. Um, there is now that's the book by the Royal Commission on toll booths throughout Scotland. So studies have been done about this building type. Um, and then there is the that's the local archaeologists um, overview report on in the key thing. Oh. oh, it's broken again. <laughs> Just take a break. Hello. All of the run this thing. <laughs> and then from that one. It's yeah. over there. Yeah, right. next one. Click it, Steve, and see if it works. Yeah, you shouldn't. It's like go back to. Ah, I remember what this was now. Um, ah, yeah, no, okay. So, having understood your building and how it's got to where it is now, it's about um, well, what can we do with that? How, you know, how, what is that as a structure? What can we do with it, and so on? Now, from a from a structural point of view, it's quite a basic thing actually um we would describe it as um this is going to the report a cellular now now what we say we have a three-story building comprising a cellular layout of load-bearing masonry walls timber joisted floors and a carpentered timber roof which is basically saying we've got you know Four walls, some internal cross walls. We've got floor joists that span one side to the other. If there were intermediate support on beams or walls, we would describe that as, as beamed floor. Um, yeah. Now, <laughs> the biscuit tin is is a good analogy for how buildings like this work. And you you know the old fashioned square metal biscuit tin. When you're taking the lid off, but as soon as you put the lid back on, it's a very rigid thing. And that's exactly how buildings like this work. The, the floors themselves are quite slender things, but because they are built into the walls, they lock all the walls together and they just hold everything together. So um, there is robustness in the walls because they are quite thick. Um, they are not monolithic things, a, a stone wall of, of given thickness, say two foot thick maybe more, um, will be will generally comprise two skins of stonework, nice pretty stone on the outside, slightly less pretty stone on the inside, a lot of stone like this. Um, and in between there will be a a void of sort and that will be filled up with um, mortar bits of stone chipping, that sort of thing. And if done well, you'll have periodic stones between the two skins will either cross between the two skins or will just interlock together. Um, and the whole thing, if done well, behaves as a single thing, a single thick wall. Um, yes, there are window openings in places, but by and large, those window openings are small and don't really affect the overall behavior of the, of the thick wall. Um, there is a question mark over connectivity between the bell tower walls and the walls of the townhouse itself, and it's something to be borne in mind when we're doing future alterations. So, um, but other buildings are not straightforward at all, and you really need to think hard about what they are. And, and to my mind, um, the way to understand a complicated building is actually to draw it out, completely draw it out. 
from from scratch and it's best if the designer does that drawing out because then the knowledge is just in their head and the process of drawing out actually allows you to understand what you're dealing with so on the top um this is i didn't have a picture of the building but it's it's part of the palace of westminster as a parliament down in london and it's trying to convey the lower two floors of the building are vaulted and you have vaults over vaults over vaults and vaults and vaults um and uh i don't expect you to understand that but i do expect you to think that's quite complicated <laughs> what you've got is timber joist sitting on brick jacquard floor um carried by um brick piers it's effectively a roman hypercourse up in the air that roman hypercourse is built on a series of vaults carried by a series of cross walls um, and there are vaults underneath that as well that was drawn out in that much detail because we were cutting down through those vaults and we really understand it now nowadays that sort of thing is done through CAD um, computer building building information modeling yes that's right uh revic techniques whereby every component of a building is drawn um and put together and so you really understand how all the pieces fit together now at the end of the degree every discipline shares that computer model so all the light switches are on that model all the plug sockets all the pipes from the toilets all the steel beams you can see how far you can take this um i don't know whether that computerized process is necessarily as good as the drawing out process because there comes a point where you are one or two steps removed from the computer model do you really understand what you're dealing with but anyway the point is drawing out is the only way really to understand a complex thing in my opinion um, now that can be from the big the big scale the whole building right down to small individual components and in this instance we have a beamed floor, so timber joists carried by a timber beam. And on the face of it, that looks like a solid timber beam, but actually it's not. It's a timber beam made of lots of other bits of timber and, and what have you. It is, um, this is it in cross section, and it's two halves of timber creating the outer shell. And in the middle were two pieces of timber cut as longitudinal wedges so that's in cross section that's in longitudinal section so you've got the outer casing and there's the outer casing top and bottom you have the two wedges folding wedges we call them because just two wedges in opposition to each other because you can tighten them up um, and you have your longitudinal wedges there and those longitudinal wedges are in turn held in place by vertical wedges, vertical folding wedges, which you can just see one there. Now, this is a, a late Georgian, early Victorian um, invention, acknowledging that hardwood timber like oak is stronger and stiffer than softwood timber like pine. So what they've done is the outer casing is a pine, a softwood, and the inner timbers, the, the wedges are oak, and they've tried to um, pre-tension this beam by, by causing it to arch. They wedge everything so much that it, it, it sort of it arches upwards. So then when you put load onto it, it, it has that extra capacity too. Um, but you'd only know that by looking closely at what you are doing. Um, they, these things are all lovely, but they invariably, um, Fall down is a long word, but they 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 invariably don't work because timber shrinks and so therefore loosens up, or people don't know the wedges at all and they take the wedges out. And... <laughs> so yeah. Um, right, that building again. So the building issues. How has the development affected the stability, the robustness, uh, the integrity of the building? This is the the farmhouse down in Buckinghamshire we were talking about before. Um, that is 1750 thereabouts maybe a bit later 
The earliest part of the building there is 1550, similar framed, you know, medieval thing, um, um, with very fancy posts, we call them crown posts, holding up roof and, and things. I won't, I won't go into it too much, but this is the drawing which was done on site the first time we did it. Now, the point about a structure like this is the crown post holds effectively holds the rafters up. The crown post is sitting on a on a timber frame below. Now, there's the crown post, and the crown post. This is a section, longitudinal section, drawn through that part of the building. Crown post here is this part here. Um, the build this part of the building would have originally extended at least twice the length. Yeah, it's been truncated and they've, they've retained this part of it. So that's the crown post. The crown post is, is carrying what's called a crown plate and it's the crown plate which effectively carries the battery. But the, the uh, let me get this right, the, the crown post is sitting on a timber beam, which you can just, it's just off screen there. That timber beam carries a big timber beam here, which hangs, ceiling structure off it. So we have a beam spanning in and out of page, beam carrying the ceiling structure, sitting on beam sitting on beam. Okay, fair enough. The beam over here doesn't meet the wall. The beam is carried by some very slender timber hangers. Um, you can just make out one there. A timber hanger, which is nailed to the side of it, nailed to the side of the crown plate, and then is nailed up to a purlin up here. That purlin sits in the wall there. The purlin comes back and is back propped off the post, the, the beam itself. So it basically is, you know, it's hoisting itself up by its own bootstraps. Anyone could have gone in there, tripped up, fallen, and knocked any one of those posts out, and the whole thing would have come down. And that's the whole point about ill conceived. Um, alteration. Um, yes, the thing has been stood like that probably since that part of the building was built, so 150 years maybe. Something. The only reason I haven't fallen down, fall down is because no one has actually tripped up and knocked something out there. So that's delicate. That sort of thing is delicate and you need to treat with care. What we ended up doing there, just by the by, is we've just basically Made we put little purpose made metal back bracketry, making sure that everything was properly fixed to everything else. And then we just tied the end of the beam to the wall there just to make sure we didn't change anything, we just made sure it was all properly fixed. So, have you got something like that in your building? At um, in the Keating, we didn't. Um, the big issue for us became this wall, the main cross wall dividing between the the um. The bell tower and the, the main part of the building. Um, very thick. It's got the chimney flues in it. Those, I don't know if that's the exact locations of the chimney flues. They're just showing, just highlighting the point over the wall is not necessarily thick and uh, solid. Um, so, the main issue to tackle with the site is to make it as easy to use as possible and to give full access to every full and easy access to every floor level, which meant a rationalization of floor levels, mainly ground floor level, but also circulation space, vertical circulation space, how to get people up and down the building um, in normal use in a, in a fire escape situation and bearing in mind that there's people with mobility issues you need to get up there so we absolutely need that a lip. Um, we explored three options for that. Um, the first couple of options were essentially variations on a theme but um, were accepting that for the most part the the spaces you want to use were in the townhouse and we want to use the um, uh, the, the bell tower part of the building for the circulation. So um, A is, let's see if we can put the lift within the bell tower itself, because for the most part, the bell tower is just due to part of the top, and then getting staircases up and down. Um, that was um, rejected straight away. Um, 
partly because the 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 lift shaft would go up so high that it would eventually foul the, the bells and mechanisms and everything up at the top. I know the bell is gone, but um the tower where it closes up would be affected by the um by the lift shaft. Also um the circulation space is just a poor internal environment there. Um, next option, a variation of theme, take the lift out of the bell tower bit, put it into um, the main, I don't, know, I don't know what we call that, foyer space, I don't know, that space. Um, and you can see it's just in the way. Um, you still got to get the staircase up around the building and stairs need to have certain proportions to them. They can't be too steep, they've got to have landings. You've also got to be mindful that in a fire, can, fire escape condition, um, people might be massing in this area and is there enough space for them to do that? And then, then you get into issues of what we would call fire engineering, which is all about timing how long a thing is going to take to burn, timing how long it takes people to get out and move from place to place, and it all becomes very, very tricky, and it's just all very congested. When we, uh, are people going to site this afternoon? You'll see it's not a big thing. Um, so the third option is to move the lift out of that foyer area and put it in where the crosswalk was. But doing that, all of a sudden, whereas before the, the two previous op options <laughs> are essentially about just removing the floor between the walls and putting small openings in walls. Now we're talking about taking out an entire crosswalk of the building. Um, and you're talking about taking out for its full width. You're talking about dealing with an area where um, interface of two different phases of construction. Um, it's a major stability component of the building. Uh, you've got chimney flues in there. Uh, and and uh, once you start taking something apart, it's very difficult to stop. So even with the best will in the world, more would have happened. Um, the temporary works associated with doing this would be very, very big. It's proportionate to everything. And from a a lot of historic fabric point of view, you know, this is the extreme, this is the work. Um, and slowly and surely, we're being led down the path of, well, the real tricky thing here is the lift is to get the vertical component in. And why not put that outside the building um, where the effect on the building itself is, is limited um, and you have space to, to tackle the thing like the digging the lift bit and so on and so forth. Um, and that became the chosen option. Um, I should say in all this that there's very close engagement between the design team and organisation like Historic Environment Scotland. Um, and you know, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Every, every option is put to them. We could do this, but the implications of doing this are A, B, and C, and type of that. And, and as, as much about the complexity and the cost, obviously, is, is, is about what is both happening to what. And after you know, iteration and discussion and what have you, it was concluded that we put the lift outside the building because in doing that, it maximizes the space in the foyer it, it eases the emergency exit issues we're talking about because you have big landing areas and what have you have, you have big space to congregate. Yes, um, yes, you are affecting the graveyard, but being outside the building is much more manageable to deal with it. Um, yeah, and then the actual alterations to the building from a structural point of view, are much lower, the far lower key. So this is the, the sketch we showed before, what the structural layout of the building is in the existing condition. And this is effectively what it is in the proposed condition. So we put a couple of exits, we've, we've widened that opening, just see coasts on there. Um, we've lost a cross wall of the tower, we've put an opening out the back, 
Um, but essentially, if the same structure is doing very little in the way of uh, change in the building. I've highlighted this area here because we did feel that having taken out a corner there, or you know, continuity of the walls around the corner, corners are always strong points, we just be sure that the floor actually is tight to the wall, so it can hold everything together. Yes, so from a structural point of view, these, these are extracts from our drawings. We have ground floor level, first and second floor level. Um, we have created the new vertical circulation stair, vertical circulation in this, I'm calling it the foyer, I don't know what it's called, but I'm calling it the foyer. In this area here, we have the lift taken out with the building completely and becomes a feature. Um, we've created some, we've either widened some existing openings or created new openings, um, but they are small and discrete openings rather than massive openings, much more manageable. It's the scale of, of, of change that is much more manageable, um, much more low key, and also allows the building to be read as the historical thing that it was. Taking a whole wall out of the building can completely confuse. Present a confused picture of you know, how the building developed and, and what it did. Um, so now it's about communicating those proposals. Uh, and in doing that, you've got to think about what your audience is, what message you're trying to get across, um, what purpose your communications are being put to. Um, drawing, we produce full layouts of all of the, the full layout of the building, every floor level will produce cross sections through the building and we obviously produce detail of pertinent points. Oh, sorry, I've completely forgot to say something. So I'm gonna go back. Um, what do we do? So we, vertical circulation call the external lift. Um, as part of improving the thermal efficiency of the building, wanted to, to maximize the, the thermal properties of the external wall. Um, I think insulation has been put into, there's, I think there's lining, insulation lining to the external walls. Um, the external walls have been repointed to, to 100%, I don't know. Um, traditional old walls like we're dealing with, are never going to behave, perform as good as you know, a modern day insulation. But the way to make them perform as good as they possibly can is, is to return them to, as, is to, to allow them to behave as they would have originally. Um, I showed the slide at the beginning of modern cement mortar on the stonework. Now the stonework is degrading, but as well as affecting the condition of stonework, pointing like that can trap moisture in your walls. And if you've got damp walls, they're going to be cold. So you remove all that modern stuff, um, put lime-based mortars back, and the moisture movement through the walls can happen again. Um, moisture moves through walls by going out through the mortar wall. So you want to allow that pressure to happen, so your walls dry out and they can become warm things again. It's like the duffel coat. The duffel coat is warm, but if it's wet and the light becomes saturated, it's just going to be cold and damp. Um, we wanted to improve the, uh, the, the floor um, thermal performance and dig out, we dug out the existing concrete slide, I think it was, and we put in I think it's a lime creek floor. I might be correct. I need to be corrected by that. It is. The lime creek floor um, on a build-up, which again, it's all about breathability. The build-up has insulation, uh, has insulative properties to it, but also didn't want to have membranes in the construction. You don't want to have plastic membranes in. Um, and you can do that by casting a concrete slab made of lime-based concrete onto quite a thickness of granular material, which is all single side sized material, and thereby you don't get a uh, capillary action happening. So you don't get rising damp. So you don't need to have membranes because you don't have, because you haven't got 
plastic membrane in there, which would normally be your damp roof membrane. Um, just mush moving through the building just just does its own thing, and it's not it's not being forced to do something that it wouldn't have done originally, and therefore you lose control over it. So it's all about. So how, how do you deal with the dampness for the uh, retention wall the back? Is that there any issues with the space yeah. around at the back? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Sorry. Apologies for that. You're right to answer that question because the back of the motion is not constrained on the back of the wall. It's quite a lot. I mean, when you're out for logical investigations, what points there, there's a coat cap that's come out from the yeah. end of So if it's not exiling one, there's been maintained. There's a little bit of a channel um, which seems to be on the inside of the uh, on the external between between the base running and the actual edge of the building. There's a little bit of a channel. It's actually a gap. So it's the same principle that just keep them all dry by just allowing it to drain itself. Yeah. Yeah. But you're dead right. You'd have to tackle that. Yes, we'd have to tackle that, and it's and it's it's about circulation. You can't trap anything. Yeah, uh, it's you know it's this isn't a lecture about how traditional buildings work, but essentially they work like a, a duffel coat works and keeps you dry and warm. And that you can go out and be outside in the duffel coat and be quite perfectly happy and dry and warm, and then it dries out when the rain stops and everything's good. But if you allow your if you you know if it stays wet, it's always going to be wet. You're always going to be cold, and then. So you want a building, <coughs> a traditionally, excuse me, a traditionally built building to behave in that way. So if you try to waterproof your duffel coat with, um, you know, the stuff that you would use to waterproof a Gore-Tex jacket, you're going to get a problem. The, the two technologies just don't work. So go back to what the thing was. Um, so yeah, an issue which um, we fell foul of during construction was that the, the floor we wanted to put in at ground level, um, because it has deep construction, we wanted to be sure we weren't going underneath the wall because to go underneath the wall means you have to underpin it and that could become a headache in itself. Did, did you find water running underneath the building when you dug down? Um, don't think no, 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 no. Okay, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Right, okay, so communicating proposals. Um, You've got to do drawings which are accurate. It's, it's a real bug there. Things generally go wrong where you haven't drawn something out accurately. Um, one tries to, you know, there are such things as standard detail, but obviously things aren't standard all the time. And um, a good way of, of drawing things out and getting the context right, and here's an example, this is not um, the town hall, but this is an example where we were we were working in a dilapidated building, having to do repairs in its roof space to ceiling joists and what have you. And so the way the, the, the works were communicated was, well, that's a photograph of the existing situation. This is what I want you to do. And that is just chasing of that. You can see. And straight away, straight away, people can see what they're dealing with. They can see that. Well, there's a whole lot of pigeon crap in there that we have to take out. And so, so much more is communicated by the photograph than just the photograph. Um, at the other extreme, um, School of Art in Glasgow, burnt down. You might, might have been aware of that. Um, this is the wall of the library, important elevation of the building. Um, you can use BIM techniques to really draw everything to the nth degree and almost explore through prototyping, but, <clears throat> but in a virtual situation, everything you're going to have to do to, to repair and rebuild that wall. And that wall needs to be taken down and rebuilt again. And we explored the temporary works, we explored and drew out and provided to the contractor. These are all the stones you're going to have to do and not on this slide, but this is how you put it all back together again. So when we actually did come to put it all back together, again, all the problems had been explored in the beginning with the contractor's input, and everything went perfectly on site. And then it went down again. <laughs> anyway, but that's one extreme. Um, 
Um, and then it's about managing risk. And in an existing building um, where you know, you're really only going to know what you're going to encounter when you take everything apart. And clearly, you can't take everything apart during the design phase. So you just the hope is that you've done enough targeted investigation to to inform what you're going to do when you get to site in terms of cost, in terms of program, in terms of complexity, and all that sort of thing. Um, a good practice to follow is produce drawings showing this is what we're doing. Go away and price that. But be prepared to do this. Be prepared to do that. Be prepared to do the other. So when change does occur, well, at least you know how you're going to tackle that. And at least the provisional work has been costed. And so there's a, there's a mechanism for coming back and you know, remeasuring and, and what have you. Now, the big thing on this project from the outset was well, we know we're putting a lift shaft out the back, um, and that lift shaft is in a Kirk card, which is obviously 70 grand, because we're going to encounter variables here. Um, and the practice is that when digging in, in the Kirk yard, um, it's done by archaeologists, or the remains which are encountered are, are, are handled sensitively, they're all logged, and all the material is, is carefully set aside, um, and then all the remains are reinterred and so on and so forth. But, so that's part of it, but also we're working next to um, buildings which, whose foundations are high up. We know we're digging down here, but you've got a wall right there and its foundation is there. So you need to be careful about how you find your excavation. Not simply just go digging in, thinking you've just got a, an open field. You haven't, you've got to be mindful of everything around you. And this drawing is there. Basically, saying be aware of what you've got around you and plan. So, what lessons were learned? Um, two things. Well, I suppose the archaeology, having talked about um, limit the extent of your excavation and, and what have you outside, well, the archaeology, the, the, the lift pit is going to stop about here, I think, but we kept encountering remains. Remain and just have to carry on going further and further. And actually, ooh, um, yeah, there's a wall there which we're trying to keep away from, and that's where the bottom of the foundation is. So that's a little bit, um, yeah, nervy. Best example I've heard is digging against against the gable of a building which is cracked um, and had to be held in place by JCB. <laughs> Um, and then inside the building, we had done a trial book inside the building to determine where the bottom of the walls were. Something happened and we thought the walls were deeper than they actually were. They were not, they were shallow in places and we had to underpin two locations locally that we could put in a full depth of insulated floor structure. That we wanted. So fortunately, there had been the provisional allowance for underpinning, and we had communicated how any underpinning should be carried out. Um, so, whilst there was was additional cost from the program implications of this, at least it could be. At least you had a common grounds for measuring them. No argument later on. Um, Ashwood aren't here. Um, they're the main contractor. They might be able to <laughs> shed more light on what other lessons we could have learned. But yeah. Um, so that's the building. I was just going to touch briefly on what the care scheme is. Um, it's basically, it's the scheme by which those engineers who are experienced and knowledgeable about working with historic building structures can be accredited. Um, uh, sort of recognised, I suppose. Um, the it's the, it's it's a parallel organisation to similar schemes that um, surveyors have, chartered surveyors have, and chartered architects have, and archaeologists, and so on and so forth. They're all effectively of a piece, but this is for the engineers. 
Um, it's for chartered and incorporated engineers who have got that interest and um, experience with this sort of thing. Um, its purpose is as much to raise, raise the profile of, of dealing with conservation and engineering as it is to be a tool for commissioning people to know that they are approaching people who are right for their project. Um, yeah, to, there's a formal application process and there is a formal assessment process. Um, and when applying, you need to demonstrate that you understand fundamental issues like cultural significance, aesthetic quality, all, all of that sort of thing. What may, What is conservation? What is history? Why are things important? That sort of thing. Um, the application process is, I'm guessing there are no engineers in the room, are there? But there may be virtually. <laughs> so um, it's standard application form CV, demonstrating what, what your conservation experience is. Um, a statement of your own personal philosophy, um, why you think conservation is important. And it's as much about conservation as it is about sustainable engineering being. Um, arguably, conservation is just one extreme end of sustainable engineering. So everything we're talking about here, everything that care engineer would bring, is a knowledge and understanding and acceptance of how existing buildings behave and how they can continue to be reused. The fact that it might be historically important because Mary Queen of Scots stayed there is sort of by design. It's more about, to my mind, sustainability. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and um, something else I'll say whilst I'm on it <laughs> is um, the, the conservation crew get a bad rap because we go on about things like using traditional materials like lime mortars. It's always about lime mortars um, and so on and so forth. And that is often used as a stick to beat us with but it's essentially missing the point because you use the lime mortar because technically you have to use a lime mortar you've got nothing to do with conservation it's about the technical performance of the thing you're dealing with end of like <laughs> right. yeah uh, yes that touch out anyway um yes yeah, so um applicate uh, mm, mm, mm. Uh, case studies, have to demonstrate, yeah, submit five case studies for consideration. Um, the, the case studies should demonstrate different aspects of what you know, uh, and they shouldn't be just about big things. Um, arguably, that project we just talked about has two case studies in it. Um, how we dealt with the lift could be a case study in itself. Um, the, it's, and it's about demonstrating what you did, not what your organization did, but what you did. It's a personal accreditation. It's not a, it's not a, a conglomerate, a, a corporate thing, not corporate. Thing. Um, the application will be assessed by two assessors, plus uh, those two assessors will be engineers, but there will be um, a third assessor who is not an engineer, which will pay, um, pass comment on the application. And then you pass on. And then once you're on the register, um, there is a formal process of uh, revalidation every five years, which is a slightly slimmed down uh, version of the original application process. Basically, it shows that you're still practicing in the, in the field, you are still doing the right thing, and you are still learning. Oh, and also, it's about CPD as well. That you demonstrate you've got conservation engineering relevant CPD. Um, that's me. Any questions about anything that I did or didn't say? Did I miss something that you said? Okay. So it is left with like the glass and seal modeling thing. Yeah, it's modeling thing. Yeah. Okay. I think um, the lift, I think, is going to have a screen around it. Oh, um, and vegetation is going to be on the screen to make 
it. As I understand it, we may have blended somewhat where it's um, leaving the environment. But it's a definite modern thing. Yeah. You know, it's not something that can be mistaken for a. But you say that, but my my future me in 200 years' time will be talking about how to live. Nice kind of concert, you know, metal, the way of coming. Don't really stumped me up from our history of buildings, but yes, yeah, so it will be in one of the um, and it will be in a express modern mesh. Um, what I didn't say, sorry, we chose a lift that didn't have a deep lift pit. So we were digging outside because the, the floor level the lift was serving was lower than outside, but it wasn't a lift which needed a deep hole in the ground to work. So those lifts are fairly common, but they they carry a price premium because they're a little bit more complicated than otherwise otherwise might be. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, um, sorry, sorry. It's a different question, but um, you mentioned that there was something went wrong with the trial pit, which meant that you didn't accurately know where the bottom of the wall was. Yeah. Was that what kind of error was that? And the, in finding the bottom of the wall, did that change your understanding of the order of construction of that gable related to the bell tower? Um, my client here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, it was just an error in interpretation. Actually, it was just an error in interpretation. You know, you take measure in the hole and measure the hole. Well, uh, yeah, it was part, and also partly what actually constituted the bottom of the wall. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes the bottom of the wall might literally just be the first layer of stones on the ground, but sometimes um, the, the, the bottom layer of stones are on improved ground, which, you know, could be uh, a lined concrete thing, a uh, trench of being done, I think. So I, I think you showed two yellow bits of underpinning, but you didn't underpin another section of the same gable. Was that because you didn't need to? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So were, they, were those walls at different, found at a different pace? Then? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So there's a story. I can't, yes, there is a story there. If you look back, I'll take that. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the one at the front, um, it, that's, that is an alien section of wall, but it had already been um, hacked through. So there was a slapping at an angle through that. And it's possible that that was a previous by council access. But there was, I think, but at the beginning of the project, there were five doors and three staircases. So there was the external one, two inside. One has been removed from the inside. It was a really, really steep one that ended at the door. So it just didn't comply with any modern safety for staircases. So there was a lot of thought. And then the one at the back, I don't know why you're running at the back, but um, yeah, all kinds of interesting adaptations and, and spaces made smaller. So there's, um, for those of you who are going on the tour later, lots of steel to make usable spaces because at the same time as um, sustainable engineering, conservation engineering, and sustainable engineering, heritage projects are about finding a way for the building to have a use that wasn't much in use. The idea of the project is to make people value it, make, make people understand it, but also make it a usable space. So some of the steel has been used to make tiny, tiny spaces a bit bigger and more workable for its community. Um, you'll also find on your seat there is a leaflet by the organization that you can set up a community organization to manage the building. They are very interested in hearing from anybody who might want to use it and has a view or would like to volunteer because the way to make this to embed this building in its community and to give it a sustainable future is to put it back in the hands of the community and they're being trained and guided in how to manage an historic building. They're going to have some lovely training here. Like there's no factory building, the company building. Um, so have a look at that. I've also put on everyone's seat a uh, sign-up form if you would like to find out more about what type of historic buildings trust does or more about the indicating project, we'll be sign up to our newsletter. Um, 
There was another question. It's fine. It's been answered by doing that picture again. It was about access to the lift. Ah, right, okay. <laughs> that was just a picture to the graveyard, but no. <laughs> it's okay. access on site. Was there any questions online? Yeah, uh, there was one about if you have an image of how the lift looks. Um, sorry, no, no, that's all right. On the on the schematic, the very early on in your slides, um, there is a fly through that um, parked the that, that one. So uh, you, yeah. can, you can see the cladding and the uh, yeah, we've got a funny hanging thing, haven't we? Because it's all yeah, the funny thing sticking out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Technical term. Technical term. Um, yes. You know, I think the, the, the message I, I should have concluded with, I said it at the beginning, is, um, you know, you've got to understand what you're dealing with, basically. It comes to that. And you've got to do all you need to do to really understand what you're dealing with. Because if you don't understand what you're dealing with, you're just going to get into problems down the line. So, um, it may cost a bit more to do that understanding, but it's just money very well spent. Very well spent. Uh, yeah, and 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 the acceptance and working with the existing building is the mindset thing. Actually, is it's just accepting that oh, it's been there hundred years, two hundred years, five hundred years. It's going to be fine. You know, it's we're not we don't live in an earthquake zone. Not much happens here. You get very wet weather and obviously we have problems with damp, but and we have more problems with damp. But it's quite a benign place for for buildings. And if the thing's been stood for I don't know, five years, something is it's doing something right. Um, and yeah, it might not conform to modern design criteria, but you don't know how a building's working. It's sort of doing its own thing. And I mean, Doing calculations only demonstrates one way for a thing to work. Yes. Can I just take it back to the archaeological um, investigation? So when you said you kept on, they kept on finding, uh, and it wasn't you in the no. division, but they kept on finding the archaeology. Are you effectively doing they would find one end of a, a burial and they would have to go to all the other end? And what was the interface in terms of those excavations and the design team? Um, oh, dealt, dealt with that side of things more than more than me. Sorry, more than that. So that's a question best directed all there. Actually, are you, are you cutting on the that too? So you can be oh, principal. Yeah. But that that is an archaeological protocol, which again was um, arranged with Bereavement Services. Any excavation in an area is considered like very well there. If there's even a tiny part of another skeleton found, then there's a, a responsibility to investigate. They don't just chop off but, and they get it out, get it out, get it out. But uh, so that's why it became a more extensive excavation because there are protocols, uh, all of which were followed with great sensitivity, was um, observed. Um, can I just ask a quick question? It's kind of unrelated, well, unrelated to the townhouse, I think. But I see that the old um, hall across the road, the, the, the toll booth is now up for sale, but which is for sale independently. Uh, it's not, does it come under the umbrella of the Heritage and Regeneration Project? I mean, it seems like a similar age and similar yeah, history. It's, it's a fascinating building. Mm -hmm. um, and the keeping is remarkable mm -hmm. because it's got five A listed buildings in a tiny concentration. Um, for what else is awesome and, and sort of, and it's an indication of the significance of the townhouse because in order to be on the borough council, you had to reside in, in the keeping. And the Hendersons were the biggest uh, landowners locally, and they lived in Fordell Castle, but that was not technically close enough. So they built Fordell's lodging in order to be able to still control the Summit Center Borough Council because it was such an affluent and it's successful, such an internationally significant trading hub. Um, so Fordell's lodging was built there. It was in private ownership, um, still is in private ownership, and a private owner. Um, we we can only deal with within the project um buildings that are um uh 
uh, so that are that are eligible to get on part of the project. Um, so we're hoping that the nine owner will be friends yes. from that fantastic building, which will have a great facility on its doorstep. Um, but yes, and the other building, which is a huge significance, um, is the priory, <laughs> um, which um, is originally part of the project, but um, it just made the whole global project costs too big. So we would still like, like a sort of building structure, working with five council, mm -hmm. we would still like to find the future for that building. So mm -hmm. we will continue working to do that. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably the moment to thank Steve very much for. Mm -hmm. Fantastic talk. <laughs> if anybody present or um, joining online would like a CPE certificate, just email and I will get one out to you to confirm your um, attendance at this event. And um, thank you very much to the Lime Centre for hosting us. And to anyone who's online, I'm really sorry that there was difficulties getting in uh, this morning or this afternoon. But we have recorded it so they'll get sent out to you so that you can watch the beginning of Steve's talk that you may missed. Um, so again, sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure. But anyway, thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.